Hello? Justice, hello! Oh my, here, here I thought I was the only person. <laughs> Is your it's a weird day until it's Wednesday. Oh, here we go. We got some more people. If no one else shows up, this would just be like a, a nice little tutoring session. Oh, there we go. Five's a party. Never mind. It's no longer a get together. Safa, hello. Welcome, everybody, to our, our once, maybe, maybe once in a semester hump day class. You've never seen me on a Wednesday before. I'm not, I'm not shaving or anything. This is me raw. So welcome. How's everyone doing? I'm doing good. That's a, that's a good point, Saf. I guess, I guess you don't speak for everybody. I need to ask you each individually, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> However, I mean, if Saf is doing well, I mean, that's got to be contagious, right? So, so, I mean, everyone's doing well, I hope. Hopefully COVID is the only contagious thing out there. So a uh, four day week, is this better or worse for people? Is it better because there's less class or worse because teachers expect the same, the same amount of, same amount of uh, effort? Ladder. Uh, pretty much the same, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not much That's has about, changed. I guess there's no free lunch, but I mean, it feels like Tuesday, but it's actually Wednesday. Tomorrow's Thursday, which is basically Friday, right? Right. And the weekend. Look at that. How quick that goes. But anyway, you know, who even cares about the weekend? Because the weekend, you can't learn discrete math, unlike Wednesdays this week. It's a very special week. So welcome back, everybody. I'm going to start sharing my second camera in the advanced setting. Ooh. Look at that. Already set up and everything. Nice. So, to start off, does anybody have any questions about anything? Really? No questions? Like, where do we go when we die? Or, like, does the universe last forever? Okay, interesting. Well, the point is, I can't answer those questions, but I can't answer discrete math questions, which hopefully will have a lot, because the more you know, the more questions you have, because just knowledge leads to more interesting questions and things like that it's a constant circle that's how math works and today we're going to continue learning section 2.3 we're actually we're actually going to finally do our first real interesting argument today and i hope you guys understand like i hope you guys have some understanding of actually how interesting it is in the fact in, in the sense that just three weeks ago we talked about arguments as things right, things that connect statements, but we didn't really have any proof that they work. There's a lot of ambiguity. And now we're here and we're doing arguments and at no point did anything seem that complicated, I don't think. I think we're just doing truth tables and it seemed like we were pushing paper, right? But pushing paper, bureaucracy has led us to some amazing results. So let's get started today. And I was gonna write down what I just said because it's important. And that is that arguments um, connect the truth of premises to the truth of, there we go, truth of conclusions. That's just what they do, that's how they roll, that's kind of by definition, right? So for example, one, one argument form that we have goes like this, where you have P implies Q and P, and those are your premises. By the way, I don't know if I made this abundantly clear last time, but let's make it abundantly clear now. Whenever you're doing an argument and you say like P implies Q or P, it's assumed what you're saying is that like P implies Q uh, is true and P is true right just like just like for example if i were to tell you like hey um the movie tenet is out in theaters you know you're, you're, you're not going like oh, we got a question Interesting. um um the, the, the point is you're not you're not going like uh or, or, or if i were to tell you like hey um i have 
uh, a fish, right? You, you're not going to say like, oh, wait, are you saying I have a fish is true? Or I have a fish is false, right? If you just say a statement in the real world, it's assumed it's true. Same thing here. So saying P implies Q, or we're saying P implies Q is true. And saying P, we're saying that P is true. And these are our premises. And then we proved last time, we proved that therefore this implies, logically implies our conclusion which is true, right? And you prove this by showing that no matter what P and Q are, right, if they make the premises true, the conclusion must be true. That's what we did last time. That's our, that, that should be getting us caught up. Anyway, this right here, this argument, this argument form is called or, or, or what should we name it? Because we have multiple argument forms. What do you think it should be named? Come on, I'm getting a baby book for everything. Well, if no one has an option, we're gonna go with what the uh, mathematicians that first thought of this are called, called it, and they called it modus ponens, obviously. Right, of course, it just looks like a modus ponens. You know, it's a unisex name. Mm. Uh, the point is, yeah, they call this type of argument modus ponens, but there's more than one type of argument, clearly. Another one is this right here, and that is P implies Q and not P, therefore, I'm sorry, and not Q, therefore, not P. So here, these are our premises, and this is our conclusion right here. And is it a question or is that just static? There we go. And, and notice that, um, or these questions for me, and notice that, that this, this argument right here is different from modus ponens, right? In modus ponens, you have P implies Q, you assume P, and then you conclude at Q. Here you have P implies Q and not P, and you assume, or sorry, not Q, and you assume not P. So this is a different argument, and it's called modus tollens. They're kind of cousins. And why do you think this argument is correct? Or valid, I should say, valid. These are argument forms, right? Argument forms can't be argument forms can't be correct or incorrect because they it requires the premise to be true. But we just have we just have uh, variables here, right? We have now we're not saying these are true or false. We're just saying that if these variables work out such as the premises are true, then the conclusion is true. But we can't say they're valid. So what why do you think this argument form is valid? I have, a good, I have a good feeling about this message in chat. Gotcha positive, question mark. Yeah, because it's gotcha positive, also question mark. I'm, you know what? The question mark means you're humble. But let's see some confidence here, right? Yeah, because it's contra positive. Remember, P implies Q is equivalent to not Q implies not P, right? And if you have not Q implies not P, and you know not Q is true, what's that imply? Not P. So here's the proof of that. So if we had, uh, I'll say proof, of modus tollens, right? That so remember, in order to prove that an argument form is valid, which is what we're trying to do here, right? What you do is you say that whenever the premises are satisfied, the conclusion must be satisfied. So let's just assume P and Q are statements. such that P implies Q is true and not Q is true. So this is satisfying our premises right here. And so we want to show that whenever this happens, by necessity, not P needs to happen, right? So let's see here. Note 
the contrapositive logic, like you just said, it all comes down to that. Note that not Q implies not P is equivalent to P implies Q by contrapositive law. Which we call it a law, but remember it's not really a law because you proved it had to happen. It was not made up. It's more like a contrapositive observation. So by contrapositive law, and um, thus, not Q implies not P. Oh, sorry. You fine? Is there a question? There, there's no question. I just came in and it turns out I was unmuted while I was talking. <laughs> Go ahead. You're good. You're good. You know, you, you don't need questions to be engaged, have engagement, right? That, that's what it's all about. So, thus, not Q implies not P, and that equals true. For example, if you like propose to your girlfriend, right? I've wanted to get you propose to your girlfriend and she asked a question. That's not the only way to get engaged. I don't know what I'm talking about. I heard the word engagement and I'm, I'm rolled with it. But the point is, um, yeah. So we have that not Q. So, so since uh, P implies Q, as opposed to not Q implies not P, and P implies Q is true, we know that not Q implies not P is true. There we go. Then Uh, I'll put it down here. Then not Q implies not P and not Q. Therefore, not P by what? Contrapositive law. Uh, not really contrapositive law. So let's go through what we've gone through so far. So we've assumed, we've, we've assumed that P and Q are statements that make our premises true right here. And we know if the premise is true, we know, if, uh, and one of the premises is P implies Q. If we know that premise is true, then you know that um, by the contrapositive law, that not Q implies not P is true. You know this condition is true, right? So we've already done contrapositive law here. That was, the, that, that was a key point. Good, good job pointing that out. But what tells us that if not Q implies not P is true and not Q is true, we can therefore conclude not P is true. What tells us we can do that? Modus tollens? Well, close. Modus tollens is this thing right here we're trying to prove, right? That is, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the chat, we saw modus because look at this, right? If we kind of put parentheses around to look at it this way, we're just saying, this argument right here is saying that if, if one thing implies another thing, and the one thing is true, therefore the other thing is true. That's exactly what modus ponens is. It's a little confusing because we have nots here instead of p's, but really it's like the not q is your p here, and the not p is your q. That's kind of what's going into these. Right, and so and so this idea that if one thing applies to another thing and another thing is true, and, and the one thing is true, therefore the other thing is true. That's exactly what modus ponens is saying, right? Modus tollens just flips it around a little bit with the contrapositive, and so this works by modus ponens. So we can say, thus, not p is true, so modus tollens is valid. So are there any questions about that? Really all we did here is say by the contrapositive law, we can flip, we, we can make this equivalent to um, not Q implies not P. And then once we have that, well, if we're just saying, if not, if something, then another thing, and if something's true, then not P, which is modus ponens. So we're just kind of applying modus ponens to this new, to these two things right here. Does that make sense? Maybe? I hope this makes sense. Meditate on this. But of course, there's another way to prove an argument valid. There's another way to prove an argument valid. A truth table. Truth table. 
that's the answer to everything in this class, right? Everything theoretically comes out of truth tables. So actually not everything, we'll see why later. That's where things get, that's where things start really start heating up. But anyway, right here, where we could use a truth table. So I'll say alternate proof of, there's a second on there, of modus tollens, use the truth table. And so if we look at, so let's go ahead and fill up this table right here with all the possible options for P and Q. So P and Q, right, they can be true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. We've written that 10,000 times, right? These are possible options for P and Q. And then in the case where you have true, true, not Q is false, opposite of true. And then P implies Q is true. In the case where you have true, false, not Q is the opposite of false, which is true. But P implies Q, I mean, that's going to be false, right? Because P is true, the if P happens, but then Q does not follow, so that's false. Uh, in the case where you have false true, not Q is going to be false, opposite of true. And then P implies Q, oh, that's gonna be vacuously true, right? So this is true vacuously because the hypothesis is false. And then if you have false, false, not Q is true, and P implies Q, uh, vacuously true again, hypothesis. So we get this. Now, remember, what we're saying, if Omicron is valid, what it's saying is that whenever the premises are true, the conclusion must follow. So let's look at all the places where the premises are true. The premises are true only where P implies Q is true and not Q is true, right? So let's see. Here, P implies Q is true, but not Q is not true. So this is not, this is not one of the cases where the premises are satisfied. Um, here, not Q is true, but P implies Q is false. So we, this, the premises are not satisfied. Here, not Q is false. So again, the premises aren't satisfied. Only this last place are both the premises P implies Q and not Q satisfied. So this is the only possible case where the premises are satisfied. And then notice in this case where the premises are satisfied, P is false. So thus, In one case where premises are true, P is false, i.e. not P is true. So if the premises are satisfied, it must be that not P is true. So that means that whenever, whenever you have statements that, sat, that work like this, you know not P must be true. That's how you make your argument. So either way, either proof, whichever one you like better, the point is we, we, we can prove that most tolerance is valid. Any questions on that? Okay, good, because that means we can move on. So we've proven these two guys valid. Um, now we're going to list a bunch of other arguments and I'm not going to prove them, which screams a homework problem. So we'll see about that. But anyway, there's more arguments we can make than just this. Arguments are just things that connect the truth of premises to conclusions. So we can start thinking about what are other premises that we know necessitate certain conclusions. For example, we can have uh, P if your only premise is P, you can conclude P or Q, right? This is called generalization, right? Um, and this should make sense. I mean, you got some proof in your homework, but it should make sense that if you have P, then clearly P or Q is true, right? Um, that makes sense to me. Let's go over another one, which is if you have P and Q, well, then clearly P is true, right? Actually, I'm gonna write that over here. If you have P and Q, then clearly P is gonna be true. 
And for the same reason, if you have B and Q, clearly Q is going to be true. So these are two slightly different arguments. And these are both called specialization. The reason being, right, that you have, a, we have this statement, you have this more general statement that P and Q is true, and you're specializing to just P or just Q. That, that should make sense, right? But again, you have to prove it, you have to prove that enough permits are satisfied, the quiz should also be satisfied, but I was telling you these arguments are prove it later. Um, next we have, oh, this is, this, is, this is my favorite one, I think. I like this one a lot. Elimination. And that goes like this. If you have, uh, I'll put it right here. If you have P or Q and you know that Q isn't true, what can you conclude, do you think? I can smile all day. So if you know that P or Q is true, but you also know that Q is not true. What must be the case? P is not true? Well, P well, is P, true. P is true, right? If you have that P is not true, then that's saying that both P and Q aren't true, but then P or Q won't be true. Right? P or Q is saying one of them's true. So if you know one of them's true and not Q is not true, well then uh, P must be true because you know one of them's true. That didn't make sense. Um, and then kind of the other way around for this guy is if you had P or Q and you had, oops, if you have P or Q and you have not P, then you know that uh, Q must be true. Using the same reasoning. Once again, I haven't proved it yet, but don't worry. Someone will. <laughs> um, and this is called elimination. Like that. And then what else we got? We have, this is called transitivity. This one's simple. If you have P implies Q and Q implies R, what, what do you think we can imply there? Or what, what do you think we can conclude, conclude there? Uh, P implies R? P implies R, exactly. Because if P then Q, if that's true, and if Q then P, well, you have P, then you have Q, then you have R, right? So this P implies R. It's not a proof. It's just some intuition. This is called transitivity. And then last but not least, this one's interesting. If you have P or Q, and then you have P implies R, and you have Q implies R, what can you conclude there? What do you guys think? Throw out a guess. P implies Q. P implies Q. Not quite that. Thank you for guessing, though. So here's the, something to think about. This means that either P is true or Q is true. This tells you that if P is true, then R is true. This tells you if Q is true, then R is true. So no matter which one of these is true, you know R is going to be true. And this is very important. This one is really interesting. This one's called division into cases. And it happens all the freaking time in math. It shows up all the time. Because for some reason in math, a lot of times, we can't say that one thing is true. But we can say one thing or another thing is true. Just like here. You can say P or Q is true. But if we can show that no matter which one is true, you can still conclude R, then you're good. Right, that's all it is saying there. Um, so this division into cases, and we will do a lot of work with that this semester. But anyway, these are all of our arguments. We've only proved modus ponens and modus tollens. 
Um, but all of these argument forms can be used. And these are the names. So from now on, you can use these without proof unless I specifically ask you to prove them. <laughs> uh, any questions? Yeah, I actually have a question. Yeah, me. So, exactly. so basically anything before the therefore, we assume it's true? Yes. So, well, so anything before the therefore, these are premises. And so it's not so much assuming that they're true. All the argument form is saying, if they're true, then you can conclude the conclusion. So if you're ever doing some kind of mathematical argument, right? So let's say we have that P is that two is even, right? And then Q is that uh, three is even. Now we know that any two consec, oh, actually, no, wait. Let, 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 let's say this instead. Let's say we know, assume that, actually, no, sorry. Here's what we're given. We're given um, that for any natural number n, either n or m plus 1 is even. And we know that 3 is odd. So, what this is basically saying right here is that 2 is even or 3 is even, right? Because we know that any two consecutive numbers, one of them is going to be even. And we also know that we kind of have 3 is not even, right? So, not 3 is even, right? We have these two things. So, if you have these two things here as a premise, what can you conclude based on what we have here? That at least one of them have to be true, right? So this is exactly elimination, right? Because elimination just says if P and Q are statements where P or Q is true, and not Q is true, then P must be true. Here, think of that as your P, think of that as your Q, right? This statement's true or this statement's true, but this statement's not true. Therefore, two is even. By elimination. So the point is, that we don't necessarily assume the premises to be true. Like we do an actual argument. We don't assume the premises are true. They're either given to you as true or you prove them to be true. But then once you have the premises are true, our argument forms tell us you can conclude the conclusion. You can deduce the conclusion, maybe I could say. The argument form tells you that whenever the premises are true, the conclusion is true. So it doesn't matter how you get the premises to be true. If you get them true, you know the premises, you know the conclusion is true. Now, when you're proving an argument form, when you're proving that, you do assume the premises are true because that's the only case you care about, right? The argument form is a care when these aren't true. This is saying, right, like the like generalization is saying that if you have P, then you know P or Q. It's not saying anything about when you don't have P. When you don't have P, generalization doesn't care at all. Make sense? Yeah, I think I got it now. Thank you. We're going to do more examples, so, so it should make more sense um, as we go along. But, yes, now for my favorite part. You almost had a morning rock colors there. Wish I had a yellow, a golden, a board marker. Okay, okay. Oh, whoops. There we go. 
He's been drilling away that camera now. Um, so let's talk about this isn't a standard name, is what I call it. Argument strings. Argument strings. And when I say that, what I mean is this idea. Arguments start with a true premise, right? And deduce the conclusion is true. Is that, is it gonna, is it gonna focus? What's happening? What if, hopefully it'll just catch on. What if we use the true conclusion, there we go, as a premise and another argument. Oh, oh, this idea is tasty. This is, this is exactly where it's at. Like, I'm going to write boom. This is the whole freaking thing. Ooh, we can make more colors. There we go. This is the whole freaking thing. Oh, can you, this is not the right time to not focus camera. Can you, can you, can you? Oh, I feel like I almost had it. I was gonna draw squiggly lines and lines the focuses. It really doesn't work. Anyway, what it said last time I focus is that arguments start with a true premise and deduce the conclusion is true. What if we use the true conclusion as a premise in another argument, right? And then from that argument, you get another conclusion. And then you can use that conclusion in another argument. Then that leads to another argument, another argument. You can start stringing these arguments together and do really complex things. So, for example, for example, Consider the movie Good Will Hunting. Who's seen Good Will Hunting? No one? What actors are in it? That Damon Ben Affleck? Is it the really, uh, like, is it the really smart dude? Like, he's really good at math? Yeah, man. Matt Damon's oh, really good at math. Yeah. He's my inspiration. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, it's going to be good while hunting. Now, we're going to have some givens about it. Like, let's just say for some reason you know these following things to be true. First given, A. If a movie has Matt Damon or Tom Hanks, then it is good. Fact A. Fact B. Um, if a movie has the actor Rob Schneider, it is bad. C. I'm sorry, no, not is bad. If a movie has the actor Rob Schneider, it has multiple fart jokes. I've seen Rob Schneider, that's his style. 
Let's see. Um, Goodwill Hunting has Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. I might be spelling that right. And D, uh, if a movie has multiple fart jokes, it is bad. So these are givens. We're going to consider these to be facts. And here's the claim we're going to try to prove true. Claim. Our claim is that Goodwill Hunting does not have Rob Schneider. So, from just these facts, nothing else in the world, we're not going to use anything else. From just these four facts, we want to prove that Goodwill Hunting does not have Rob Schneider. So, first of all, let's just look at it. What do you guys think might be kind of the direction we're going to go here with this proof? There's two ways. I think you could either use A and C, or you could use B and D in like a negation sort of way. I, I think I think it's gonna use all that. So notice that good one thing is Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. That means in particular it has Matt Damon. And then if a movie has Matt Damon or Tom Hanks, then it's good. It's, it's a, it says good one thing has Matt Damon. Therefore, Goodwill Hunting must be a good movie. Notice down here, if a movie has multiple fart jokes, it's bad. But Goodwill Hunting is not bad, it's good. So what can we say about it? It's not D. Well, D is just saying... Or D is not true, rather. So D, these are all assumed to be true. These are your givens, right? So by, by given, I mean assume to be true. They're not true because there are premises. They're true because they're a given. So assume these to be true. So D is true. Exactly, exactly. Thank you, Sid. So, so Sid said, if a movie has, or, if, or Siddhartha said, I'm oh, sorry, if a movie has multiple fart jokes, it's bad. By contrapositive, that means if a movie's good, then it does not have multiple fart jokes. It has at most one fart joke, which Good Will Hunting has. That's a great joke. The point is, um, so by D, since we know by A that a Good Will Hunting is a good movie, it's not bad. Therefore, it has at most one fart joke. It does not have multiple fart jokes. But if it doesn't have multiple fart jokes, it can't have Rob Schneider. Because if it had Rob Schneider, it would have multiple fart jokes. That's going to be the direction. I hope that makes sense. Let's get mathematical and prove it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to clean this all up um, by making some notation for all this stuff. So I'm going to say that MT... Um, uh, where's all my notation here? Actually, let's write a piece of paper. Let's get a piece of paper. All right. So we're going to say that MT or M, yeah, M is going to mean that a movie has Matt Damon. T is going to be that a movie has Tom Hanks. Uh, B is going to be that a movie 
as Rob Schneider. I'm oh, sorry, that's gonna be R. R is gonna be a movie as Rob Schneider. B is gonna be that a movie as Ben Affleck. Uh, G is going to be that movie is good. And then finally, we're gonna define big F to mean movie as multiple fart jokes. You can tell I'm taking this seriously. Yes, so these are um, just, the, the, we're just gonna make, use these letters to make, our, make all of our notations simply. So if we have all, if we have all of this, right, Based on our new notation, how can we rewrite A? Actually, I'll, I'll write it down here so you don't miss anything. So then A is going to be if it has Matt Damon and Tom Hanks, and it's good. What that's saying is that if it has Matt Damon or Tom Hanks, that implies it's good, right? It must have Matt Damon, T has Tom Hanks, then it's good. B is going to be, um, uh, B says if a movie has Rob Schneider has multiple fart jokes. So that's saying if R, then big F, because R has Rob Schneider, big F has multiple fart jokes. C, that's going to be good go, go to Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. So what we know about this movie, is that both M and B are true. The movie has Matt Damon and it has B Ben Affleck. And then finally we have D, which is the movie has multiple fart jokes and it's bad. So that is F implies what? Uh, not G. Exactly, not G, because G is good, so not G means bad. There we go. So now we've written all of our stuff um, like this, just to make it a little simpler. And we have that we can write our claim. Our claim is now saying that Goodwill Hunting does not have Rob Schneider. So our claim is not R. So what we're saying is that based on these four givens, we can prove not R. So any questions about what we're doing? Okay, good, because I'm going to erase to make some more space. So I'm just going to rewrite these. So A then is M or T implies G. B is R implies F. C is M and B. That's an R. There we go. And D is uh, F implies not G. And then our claim is not R. So, proof. Let's string all these together. So these, let's string all this together to make a proof. I think if we keep writing it a focus, let's just keep going. So if we're trying to prove not R, what's the first thing that we should do? What's the first thing we said we could do? Uh, we could try to prove um, that the movie is good. And if the movie's good, it doesn't have Rob Schneider then. Exactly, exactly. Right, right. So let's try to prove the movie's good. So in order to prove the movie's good, it's really, really nice to know that the movie has Matt Damon or T, M or T is true. Um, but we don't know M or T is true off the bat, but we know that M and B is true. So let's start there. So we have M and can you please focus camera? I'm gonna fix this soon. 
So, so, so if you have M and B is true, and this is by given number C or given letter C, what can you conclude? That the movie's good? Well, not quite. We can't jump to that conclusion yet, right? Because right now we only know that M and B are true. But nowhere here does it say that if Matt Day, that if M and B are true, that implies G, right? Uh, the you have to get to A. You have to get to go. To, you have to get to A first, exactly. Yeah. See you know what I'm saying, Safa? Because now, if we had a claim that said like M and B, then G, then you're totally good. We could do that. But uh, we don't have that claim, so we're trying to use just the things in here. And so in order to kind of get the movies good, we have to get to A first. So we can conclude M. And what argument form tells us we can do that? Isn't that specialization? Specialization, exactly. Good job. 50 points, Safa. There we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Specialization. That just says that you have M and B, you can conclude M. So now, since we know M and B is true by C, we know M is true, right? That's where, that's where we're concluding, M is true. So now we can use M as a premise in another argument. Specifically, in order to use A, what do we need to prove? Uh, one of the two is true, so because we know Matt Damon is true. Yeah, and just I just to use capital T for truth, so I'm going to call Tom Hanks the lowercase t. But anyway, yeah, yeah, exactly. In order to use A, we need to show that M or T is true. Okay, well, let's say here. Uh, we have M. We have M. And actually, I'm going to label... I'm going to label this first argument one, and this is our second argument, which is two, our second like little tiny argument. Um, so we have M by the conclusion of one, right? We can say we have M. And then therefore we can conclude M or T by what? Uh, generalization. Generalization, exactly. Generalization. And then, um, yeah, so, so that, that's just that. So now we have M or T is true. And now that we have M or T by two, and we have M or T implies, oh, G by A, what can we conclude? This is the whole thing, right? This, this, this is what we're trying to get at. Probably conclude D, or we can go to D. Well, remember that these are A, B, C, D. They're all assumed to be true. We know these to be true. Uh, what do we got in the chat? G, exactly. If you know M or T is true, and you know M or T implies G. Well, G is true. G is true, exactly. And, and what's this by? Uh, no, it's, uh, what do we got? What was that thing called? Yeah. It's, um, modus ponens. Modus ponens, exactly. That weird name. You guys had your chance to name it, but you chose not to. That's, <laughs> um, modus ponens, exactly. Modus ponens is when we prove that this argument form is valid. Meaning, if we have these two premises, which we know are true by two and a, then we can conclude deduce conclusion G. All right. Now, four, what should we do next? So, we know the movie's good. That's great. We're that far. Um, we want to eventually prove it doesn't have, uh, not R is true. I'll prove it doesn't have Nerov Schneider. And actually, I'm going to change this capital F to a lowercase f for the exact same reason with the T, because big T and TF, big F are the two letters I couldn't use, and I used them both. But anyway, um, the point is, 
Uh, now that we know the movie's good, someone said we can go to D. What can we do with D? Oh, can we use the division into cases? Maybe? Um, division into cases. I don't think we even really need that here. I think, look, look at this. If you know that F implies not G, what else do you know? Like, what's equivalent to this? Could it be um, G implies not F? G implies not F. So okay. contrapositive? The contrapositive, right? But we already have a rule that uses this. So let's say we use the fact. So, so if you have the G implies not F, we know G is true. That implies, that means that not F must be true. So, but the way we can write that is we can say that F implies not G by D. And then we have G by uh, E, or not by E, by three. Three is already proved G. So what can we conclude from these two things? We just kind of said it. Uh, not G implies that. Yeah, we have not G imply, or, or I'm sorry, we, sorry, oh, no, we can't say that not G implies sure, F, that's the yeah, converse. Yeah, G, implies, yeah, not G F. implies not F, right? So therefore, we have um, not F. And this is by modus tollens. So remember, modus tollens, what it did is it said that if you have an implication and you know the conclusion's not true, you can prove the hypothesis must not be true by using the contrapositive law. We use that in our proof, right? But um, this was just exactly what Modus Tolan said. Because um, remember, G is really equivalent to not, not G. And so by three, the double negative law. So you look at Modus Tolan's and you'll see that's what this is, right? It's just taking an implication. You have the implication and you have that the conclusion is not true, the conclusion of the implication, then you know the hypothesis must not be true. That's all Modus Tolan says, and we proved it, so we can use it. So this argument form is valid, so therefore not F is true, so, or F is not true. So we're almost done. So we have that not F is true by Modus Tolan's. Let's go up here and do one last little bit. Um, so we're trying to prove not R. So what given here do you think we can use to prove not R? Probably B. Uh, same thing for B. Yeah. yeah, B, right? B is saying that if you have R, then you have F. Well, we know we don't have F, therefore we must have not had R. That's modus tollens. We have this implication here. We know the conclusion's false. We know the conclusion's not true. We know the conclusion's false, and F is not true. Therefore, by modus tollens, we can conclude R is not true by using the fact, by using the contrapositive, basically. So we have R implies F by B, and then we have not F by four. So therefore, we can conclude not R by Modus tollens. Square, because we are done. There we go. We just used, right? We just used um, just these four givens in logic to prove Rob Scheider must have not been in Good Will Hunting. That's our conclusion. Any questions on that? So you see how can, we can string these arguments together like this and use kind of the conclusion of one argument as the premise of another argument, as, and then we can use, you know, we, we can kind of use multiple conclusions and put them together as another premise, and you get another argument out. And we can combine these in weird, interesting ways to prove a ton of stuff. Does this, does this make sense that we did here? I hope so. I, I think every single one of these steps is easy. All you gotta do is put them together. And, um, 
Yeah, and then notice that this is the, the format we're going to use for proofs. Notice that every single line we have a we have a justification. We have this by C. We have this by specialization. Every single line we say why we know that's true. And a lot of these we say it's true because of something we did before. Like here we know this is true because of we did here. Here we know it's true because we did here. So yeah. Any questions on this? Okay. We have like four minutes left. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go over some logical facts. Actually, I'm first going to go over contradiction, which is fascinating. And then in the remaining time, I'm going to go over logical fallacies. So, which we shouldn't run into. Logical, these logical fallacies, yeah, well, we'll see. So, oh no, I ruined my Hawaiian shirt. Oh, so uh, let's go over contradictions. This is another argument form that we kept separate because it's so special and so interesting it deserves its own topic and it's gonna get its own topic later. But for right now, here's what a contradiction is. It has this argument form. If P implies F, meaning false, if P implies something that's false, what can we conclude? Weird. Can we conclude that P is false? P must be false. Here's why. This implication is saying that if P is true, then we have false. It's saying if P is true, then false is true. Right? That's what it's saying. If P is true, then false is true. But false certainly is not true, meaning P must not be true. It's a proof by contradiction because it's saying we've reached a contradiction. If P is true, then false is true. False is true. That's, that doesn't add up. That doesn't square. Contradiction. That's a contradiction. So you have not P. And then a quick proof using the truth table would be let P be a statement. Um, and then we have P. And let's look at P implies false. So remember, for a premise, we look at all the cases where, or for our argument, we look at all the cases where the premise is true, and we need to, in order to show it's valid, we need to show that in all the cases the premise is true, the conclusion is also true. So our only options for P are true and false. And when P is true, right, let's see, when P is true, P implies false, this is if then, Right, this is our if then operator where the, we have P and false, which is the if then operator where we have true false. And what's the if then operator give you when you plug in true false? False. False. Exactly, because you because you have if you have the if, but not the then. Right? The FP happened, but the then did not happen. So this is false. In the case where P is false, the if then operator, I'm just gonna skip the first step, gives you false, false, and what's that gonna be? True. True, vacuously true, because your hypothesis is false. So this right here is the only case we have our premise, P implies F, to be true, only here. And that when that's true, we know that P is false, otherwise known as not P being true. So, yeah. So if you have that P implies of something, if you have P implies something false, then you know P must not be true. And I just don't show you false here, but it could be like, if you have that like, P implies that two is odd. If a P, if, if, if there exists some P that implies two is odd, well then, you can conclude that P must be false because two is odd is definitely not true. So you can't have whatever led to that. That's contradiction. We're gonna talk a lot more on that later. Anyway, real quick before we go, let's talk logical fallacies. Uh, how do you spell fallacy? F L 
ACY? Oh, let's go with that. Logical fallacies. These are just errors in logic. And since we're showing all of our steps, we should not make any of these errors, but here are some of the big ones. Can you not do this right now, camera? Um, let's keep writing, see what happens. So some of the big ones, some of the big common ones are, uh, we have using ambiguous premises, we have circular reasoning, and we have jumping to conclusions. Like that. So, yeah. Um, and then we also have converse slash inverse fallacy. This one's the easiest one. We've already went over this one. This one is the, is the fallacy that if you have P implies Q and you have Q, then you can conclude P. This is patently false. Because if, if P implies Q and Q, that doesn't say anything about P. All this says is that if you have P, then you have Q. If you have Q, no idea what happens to P. Maybe it's true, maybe it's false, but you cannot deduce P from this information. That's the converse inverse fallacy. I mean, the other way around would be that if you had um, P implies Q, then you can conclude, um, therefore, not P. Or if you have P implies Q and you have, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, you, if you have P implies Q and you have not P, therefore not Q. Also, patently false. We don't know this to be true. And this all comes down to the fact that the converse and the inverse are not the same thing as the original conditional. So um, just because you know that P implies Q and you know not P, you don't know not Q. The only thing you can do when you know P implies Q is either use the original conditional and say that if you have P, then you have Q, or use the contrapositive, saying if you don't have Q, then you don't have P. You can't do any of this stuff. Oh, that makes sense? And biggest premises, this is just like if you have, if it rained yesterday, then it is wet out. And then you have, it rained, therefore it is wet out. The big problem here is that it rained when. It was kind of ambiguous, it rained. You know what I mean? Like if, you, if we were in Las Vegas, Nevada right now, and they, and they didn't have rain for the past two years or something like that, right? It probably rained at some point in the past, right? It probably rained it could be a thousand years ago. Maybe Las Vegas used to be a freaking ancient sea. You know what I mean? The point is, it did rain at some point in Las Vegas, but it didn't rain yesterday. So this, it rained is kind of ambiguous. When did it rain? We have to be very careful what we're saying here. This is just like kind of statement stuff we talked about before. Circular reasoning, this is the interesting one. Oh yeah, so this is not true because the it rains ambiguous. Or we can't conclude this is really because it rains in beams. I would love this to not be like this. Circular reasoning, this one's interesting. Look at this proof. Let's say, uh, given, we know that one equals one, right? And the claim is that zero equals one. Gosh, hopefully this all. Come on, come on. Come on, you get worse, not better. Worse, not better. Hello. Hello. That was really good right there. But then oh, we got the problem. I'm just gonna keep going, hopefully I go. So if you have that zero equals one, well then you have 
that zero plus one equals um, one plus one. So you have that one equals two. But then you have that one times one should equal two times one. But come on, camera. But one times one, one equals zero. So you have one times zero, and then you get that one equals zero. Check. I will move this up to the camera if it's not gonna help. <laughs> so what we're saying here in great blurry detail is that if you start with zero equals one, you can prove zero equals one. That does not mean zero equals one is true. That's circular. Just because that you can say that like, just because that some premise, or, or, or just because you have something and you can conclude itself, even go through some argument, and conclude itself, that doesn't mean what you started with is true. You have to start from true things and go from other true things. You can't start from things that you don't know are true and then try to prove them true. No, 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 no. You start from true things and you go to other true things, right? You, this is circular. That's so, circular. Yeah. So when we do arguments in this class, are we taking them on the faith that like the claims are reasonable claims and that they're like, able to be true? Oh, um, no, because okay. there are times where uh, there we have a question of, um, is the claim true or false? Right? Okay. Yeah. So, so, you know, so maybe I'll give you a ridiculous claim and you have to prove it false. Like if, if at some point that we can prove that the claim is false, can we say that sort of like invalidates the rest of it? Or we still have to go through the steps of like showing that it doesn't. Oh, so if the claim is false, we're just going to go through all the steps of showing it's false. Oh, finally, we're back. We're going to go through all the steps of showing it's false. Okay. So we'll do some more examples of that later. But basically, just like how we showed something was true, we could have showed it was false. Like in our past example, our, our claim was that Goodwill Hunting did not have Rob Schneider. If our claim instead was that Goodwill Hunting had Rob Schneider, we could have just proven it false, right? By that same argument, we would have proven that false. You see what I'm saying? So um, the claims don't necessarily have to be reasonable. However, um, the, the, the big point is that when you're doing an argument, your premise must always be true. That's the key. Never do an argument with the premise not true, because as we talked about last time, in order for an argument to be correct, your argument form, your logic has to be valid, and your premise has to be true. In this case, the premise is not true, so it doesn't matter what you get for a conclusion. Anyway, that's like the reasoning. And then finally, jumping to conclusions, that's just um, kind of, Safa did that a little bit, I think, in the past example. Uh, not to you, uh, Safa, you're a martyr, right? Not, not, not to, it, it's a common mistake. I'm not pointing out Safa, I'm just saying, it happens. I'm, saying that, I'm not saying that Safa is not smart because he put jumped to conclusions. I'm saying, look, Safa is so smart, even he jumped to conclusions, right? It happens to the best of us. The point is that um, jumping to conclusions might be saying something like, um, you know, I think we had M, M, and if you have like M or T implies G, therefore, uh, therefore G. You jump to conclusion here because M or T, or I should use little T, M or little T here, I'll just, yeah, I'll just use a different letter entirely. Let's say you have M or A, something like that, right? Um, here, by generalization, you can say that M does imply M or A, and so you can use it here to get G, but you need to show that. You can't just jump. You can't just jump from here to here because sometimes you think you know what you're doing, you make a jump, you skip a step, and you're actually wrong. That's where you show all of our work to make sure we're right. Anyway, those are logical fallacies. Don't do any of those. What this really all comes down to is two things. Number one, use your premise. Like number one, whenever you're doing an argument, whenever you're doing a little argument, make sure your premises are true. You must start with true premises. And number two, show all your work. If you show your work, you shouldn't be able to make any of these mistakes. Because this would be caught because like, well, what would it be by? But this wouldn't be by modus ponens, it wouldn't be by modus tollens, it wouldn't be by anything, you can't do it. Um, and same thing here, what would this be by? Right, none of these figure our laws. 
And this is just, um, I guess this is another one. Don't be, don't be precise. If you be precise, make sure you have true premises and show your work. Other than that, that is it. Sorry for going over. Any questions? Okay. Well, that's 2.3 people. You can start doing the 2.3 quiz. We'll do 3.1 uh, tomorrow, on Thursday. So let's stop recording.